Our Healthy Men is a presentation of the Prostate Cancer Coalition and Rare Gem Productions. The Prostate Cancer Coalition is a coalition of healthcare providers and survivors in the St. Louis region that have come together to advocate smart screening for African American men and men with strong family histories of prostate cancer. The Prostate Cancer Coalition supports the idea that there should be a discussion about the risks and benefits of screening, beginning at the age of 45 for African American men and younger if there's a strong family history. We're here to answer your questions and provide you with solutions and especially options. We want to see you thrive and we want the best for you. Our Healthy Men. And welcome back to Our Healthy Men, your prostate cancer question and answer show. I'm your producer, Jade Harrell, and we are back. Yes, we are trying to make a difference, make sure that we understand the prostate, what prostate cancer is, so we can reduce these devastating numbers and the disparities that we're experiencing and seeing in our community. So we've got the best of the best, of course. And so your hosts are with us today, Dr. Lannis Hall. Hello, uh, Jim. Hello, hello. <laughs> and we have Dr. Arnold Bullock. Thank yes, you. Washington University. Our yes. Sightman Cancer Center is being represented here. Our radiation oncologist and our urologist we've got it all covered and me I will be asking those same questions that you might have our last episode in episode one you got to discover and understand what your prostate is how it functions and the basic anatomy of the amazing as Dr. Hall says the amazing prostate so now we need to take a look at well what happens if it's not functioning as it should today we are talking about stats and facts and so we are going to start with some background and the incidences and the epidemiology if I said that correctly Very good. Uh, with yes. our doctors today. Dr. Hall, starting with you, give us a little bit about the background that we need to be aware of when it comes to talking about prostate cancer. You know, we came together, a whole bunch of physicians, including Dr. Bullock and myself, because this is a common disease. Uh, prostate cancer affects one in seven men, one in six African American men, and one out of 23 African American men will die of the disease. So it is the most common cancer diagnosed in men and the second leading cause of death in men. And for African American men, they have the highest mortality of any ethnic and racial group in this country. And the incidence, meaning how often we get it, is some of the highest in the world. When you look at African American men and their incidence, and the only people who are rivaling African American men are Jamaican men and Caribbean men. And so this is a disease that we must be intimately knowledgeable about. We need to understand it because the survival rate is excellent if detected early and treated early. But if you wait until much later in the disease process, it's much harder to treat. And unfortunately, you wait until it metastasizes or spreads to other places in the body, then it's incurable. We can treat it and we could treat it for years, but you can't cure it, make it mm. go away permanently. So this process state cancer show today is about understanding the facts because yeah. it impacts somebody you know a relative of yours it's just that common sure sure dr bullock do you want to chime in on the incidences as well well you background? know these numbers that we quote now are better than what they were even 30 years ago okay so if we go back historically and you you say well if we have such a high rate of prostate cancer and prostate cancer death disparity is so much greater now it wasn't that much greater in the past, but that's not true because, you know, we now can correctly diagnose prostate cancer. Person comes in with weight loss, bone pain, widely spread bone cancer. One of the first things a doctor is going to check is a PSA to figure out where that bone cancer is from. But we didn't have that years ago. And so um, we have made some improvements, but our improvements have a long way to go. Let's give some numbers. Back in 1984, if you look at the statistics that were published by the American Cancer Society, right. it was suggested that two out of every three African-American men at the time they were diagnosed, I already had cancer spread to some other part of their body. Two out of three. Two out of three. I already had cancer spread. They weren't candidates for any kind of cure. And you had one out of three whites. Mm -hmm. And so it was bad so for the whites. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I yeah, mean, so everybody. it was mm -hmm. bad for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so we don't see numbers anywhere like that. And a lot of that is because of the public notoriety of prostate cancer. 
you know, campaigns to say, if you have prostate cancer and you care about your family members, please, directly or indirectly, let your family members know that someone in your family has prostate cancer. It's such a shame where you have family members, fathers who are too embarrassed over the diagnosis of prostate cancer to tell their own sons, yeah. let alone tell their, their, their yeah. nephews or their cousins. Mm-hmm. And so we went from two out of three having metastatic disease at the time they were diagnosed to now the number is under 10 percent. Right. Wow. Uh, right. Even 5 percent at this five. point presenting with metastatic disease. And this, that's I can't tell you how remarkable that is. Yeah. We just don't see that. <laughs> we don't see it. We have great screening for breast. We have great screening for colorectal carcinoma. We just don't see that kind of drop. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is really due to the PSA, a a blood test, a very simple blood test that can give us a snapshot on the health of the prostate. A couple of words that came out that I wanted to clear up. So you said PSA was a blood test right. for the screening, and then you said metastatic. Yes. What was it? What does that mean? Well, metastatic means cancer has gone to some other part of your body. Okay. People, let's let's talk about that just yeah. a second. Because <laughs> 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 every now and then I'm going to need a thesaurus this, 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 so this, that y'all can this bring is a good me one. On. People say, "Well, hold it, doc. Why are you still?" examining me or checking my PSA if you took my prostate out. How could I get prostate cancer back? I said, well, because cancer can spread by many different ways. And so your cancer could have spread to my lung. Well, if I had cancer in my lung, then it would be lung cancer. Right. That's like a guy. <laughs> right. That, that I love you, this story. <laughs> I, this is what this is my analogy. I got uh, all these analogies in my office. <laughs> yes. I said, so let me ask you something. If you hired a guy who was in your restaurant and you hired him to clean up your restaurant. He's in your restaurant. You can't talk to the guy. He only speaks Chinese. Uh-huh. But he's in your restaurant in Kansas. Would you call him a guy who's from Kansas or a guy who's from China? <laughs> <laughs> It'd be Eureka. a guy from China. It'd I don't care where he is. I he's a Chinese that. guy. That's a right? great analogy. I mean, so yeah. at the end of the day, he's a Chinese guy right. working in your restaurant in Kansas. And at the end of the day, this is prostate cancer right. working in your body or spreading the, through your body to your as prostate, right. prostate cancer. But we're bringing up a common misunderstanding. Sure. I mean, cancer. And, and, not, and that is and that when itself. cancer goes from the original site from the prostate gland, and if it does spread to the lungs and the liver and the bone, it is not that you go home and say, I now have lung, liver, liver and, and bone, bone cancer. cancer. Well, no, you have, <laughs> you have metastatic mm-hmm. prostate mm-hmm. cancer. And you have cancer that, it's spread. that is spread. So if a biopsy is taken from that area, the lung, liver, bone, it's not going to show that it's a lung cancer. It's going to show it's prostate cancer that's spread to the lung or so spread to the liver. So so that's why that's we commonly mm-hmm. do a biopsy. Even if someone like remotely had a history of a cancer treated 10 years ago and we see something suspicious, we want to do a biopsy. You don't just presume that it must be back. It could truly be something different. Sure. So in order to make sure you understand what's going on, that's that's why we commonly will re-biopsy that area. I love it. Gets, so, but that's this is the stats and facts show. So fact is, if you have prostate cancer and it spreads, which is metastasizes, then it is still prostate cancer, even though it's wandered somewhere else in your body, as with the other cancers. So that's a great lesson to learn. And the last one was carcinoma. Is that essentially another word for cancer? It is. And it's a type of cancer that starts in the epithelium. So, uh, you know, we have, (laughs) well, so, uh, you, you know, you have different kinds of cancers. You have cancers that are manifest in the bloodstream and mm-hmm. you have cancers that develop in the lymph glands okay. we call that lymphoma and then these are cancers that uh, and these are tumors when we have cancers that develop in a solid tumor mm-hmm. like the lung and like the liver and and also like the prostate gland we call those carcinomas be they begin in the epithelium mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. so you <laughs> she, she said epithelium yeah. like that was different than <laughs> <the> epithelium <laughs> you, you, know, you know i get it, it though know, but it's, it's, I, I definitely am making the, the connection linings, there yes. in the lining yes okay yes, yes, yes. what's the spanish word for meat or beef Car- 
Uh, yeah, uh, carne. Uh, carne. Carne. There's carne, some there's some yeah. etymology there yeah. is what I'm saying. So it, it actually has something to do with the tissue as opposed to blood or some right. other thing. Right. Like, so until there's leukemia yeah. and lymphomas yeah. Got and it. there's cancers. Blood and cancers and this kind. Got it. We're going to take a quick break. As we're getting into the stats and facts, that background is deep and heavy. Again, we just really want to thank the BJH Foundation for supporting this program and uh, their donations for the Prostate Cancer Coalition. You can always find out more at prostatecancercoalitionstl.org. We'll be right back. The Foundation for Barnes Jewish Hospital is a proud sponsor of the Our Healthy Men radio show. The BJH Foundation supports the world-class health organizations of St. Louis, Barnes Jewish Hospital, Barnes Jewish West County Hospital, Seitman Cancer Center, Gold Parb School of Nursing at Barnes Jewish College, BJC Home Care and Hospice, Evelyn's House, and the Washington University School of Medicine. The largest charitable foundation in St. Louis and the largest private donor to Washington University School of Medicine, supporting research, grants, educational programs, and endowed chairs. Learn more at foundationbarnsjewish.org. Stay connected on Facebook and YouTube. Phone number 314-286-0600. The Seitman Cancer Center is a proud sponsor of the Our Healthy Men radio show. Seitman Cancer Center, national leaders in cancer, whose mission is to prevent cancer in the community and transform cancer patient care through scientific discovery, one patient at a time. And welcome back, Our Healthy Men, the Prostate Cancer Question and Answer Radio Show. I'm your producer, Jade Harrell. Dr. Hall, Dr. Bullock, we're going to jump back in. Episode stats and facts we're talking about. So I just wanted to go back to a point. Back in the 80s, when mm-hmm. we said how many people were presenting with metastatic or disease that was not just in the prostate gland, but it had the opportunity to spread, I wanted to bring out two points. Okay. One, typically there are no early signs and symptoms of prostate cancer. So you might say, how is it that all of these men back then were presenting with disease that had already spread from the prostate to other organs? Well, it's because... Typically, there are no early signs and symptoms. So I don't want people to think, I don't have blood in my urine. I don't have pain down there. So I'm all good. Mm -hmm. No, you don't have to Mm -hmm. be all good. So baseline is we're not all good. We should continually, your word was be aware. Screened. We're we're going to talk about screenings when Mm -hmm. we, you know, in our future episodes. But this has to keep coming out that there are no early signs and symptoms. And then finally, back in the day, you might say... Why do I hear about prostate cancer so much now? Yeah. Didn't seem to hear about it as much before. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Bullock and I have talked about this often. When you present with metastatic prostate cancer, the treatment back then, back in the day, was an orchiectomy or removing the testicles because it's the testosterone that drives the growth of the prostate cancer. That's right. And we learned that in the first episode. So make sure you go back and check out the first episode to understand the anatomy. Me. This is why. Yeah. And so one of the main treatments for metastatic prostate cancer is to lower the testosterone and starve that prostate mm-hmm. cancer cell so you can promote death or what we call apoptosis or necrosis. Sure. And so if a patient is having an orchiectomy, that's not something you go home and talk about around a dinner table mm-hmm. after that no, has right. occurred. No, no, no. So, so you don't have the father telling the sons, okay, let me tell you what I've had to go through. Many times it just becomes silent. You're right. Yeah. And, and so this has been a real problem that men aren't talking to their sons and talking to their family about what they've gone through so that they can help protect the family sure, sure. and say, hey, you've got to get this checked out because right. I had it. And so not like women who will go in the bathroom and say, you know, I just <laughs> had this, this breast. Yeah. You know, look, look at this. I, mean, I, I was going to ask you when you went out to the car, could we do a quick, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just to be sure. Just to be sure. Age, when you know, do that? My feeling is this is, but I think, isn't that a men thing? And so we're, we don't want to gang up on you, Dr. Bullock, but it's not like you're talking about much of anything with one well, another. Know, I, I mean, I, other than what's under the hood. If you go back historically, and, and even to this day, um, there are patients who will prefer to go see an internist who won't do the prostate exam. 
they'll say, I'd rather go see doctor over here because Dr. B over here, he doesn't stick his finger in my bottom. Mm. But this doctor, Dr. A, I'm not seeing him no more because every time I go see him, he want to put his finger in my butt. And as if Dr. B is a better doctor. Because I mean, as if the Dr. A enjoys him. putting his finger in his touch. <laughs> um, but, but that's, you know, so imagine 30 years ago if uh, the majority of patients had cancer spread before we had an injection or medicine you could take that would lower the testosterone. The presumption is a lot of men who had prostate cancer had the testicles removed. Maybe you would be a little shy to tell people you That's had prostate cancer because the assumption would be Uncle Joe over there probably had his testicles removed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Way to keep it real. That's you know, what we're you know? hoping for. And yeah. so, so nowadays, I can't remember the last time we've taken out a guy's testicles. Mm-hmm. That, right. By 1990, that was almost a thing of the past because you could get a shot in your buttocks yeah. that would lower your testosterone. Sure, right. sure. So, and no one can tell that you were getting the shots. Right. I mean, no one can tell. Mm-hmm. Your voice you doesn't change. You normal. Right. You know, you all of a sudden start wearing an apron on your chest. You know what I mean? Just your voice doesn't get higher as my patient said, well, my voice get higher. No, no your so. voice does not right. get As it just did, right? And That's so, funny. So, so there's history behind mm-hmm. a lot of the things that happen. There is some historic basis for it. You know, the presumption that don't have surgery the cancer is probably the error make the cancer spread. Well, right. you, you think you about the percentage it, of people who had cancer that was already spread. We didn't have CT scans. We didn't have MRIs for certain. So the only way you know that cancer was spread was you open a person up. And as soon as you open them, you're like, oh, wow, there's nodules on the liver. We might as well close them up. So three oh, months oh, later, oh, the oh, person's oh. dead. Okay, we got to talk about the air. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> we, we, we so gotta... our stats and facts include some of these myths because right. we're right. thinking these. These are the facts, but we're going to clarify what's for real and what's maybe not so accurate. Well, they're just okay. But I've heard you they cut it open and get air on gonna, it. It's going to spread. It's That's going to spread. I, I come from that school. As if we don't breathe in air. That is. But you didn't <laughs> cut it open. See, and that when is you cut it open in the bloodstream in every cell. Yes, yes. So we we just need to dispel that. that yeah. So we can go ahead and... But mark. the historic basis of that belief is, is real. Okay. That before we had CT scans and MRIs, right. I'm sure Seemed at the like time Shirley when, was fine. When, when Lannis was in med school and when I was in med school in residency, <laughs> that we would do an exploratory laparotomy. Mm-hmm. Exploratory laparotomy, that's... Even though we use that phrase nowadays, it really is not all the way true because we have CT scans and MRIs that shows us exactly where we're mm-hmm. going, exactly mm-hmm. what we plan to do when we open someone up now. But in 1988, we'd open a person up who had kidney cancer. And before we got to the kidney, the routine was you put your hand around the liver. You run the bowel to feel for lymph nodes in the mesentery of the small bowel. And if you found these big, hard nodules on the liver, that means the cancer was spread. Hmm. The air didn't make it spread. It was spread from the moment you cut the dude open. But we wouldn't have known until you got it. Right. Right. And right. and they, they say Uncle Joe died because mm-hmm. they went to this hospital. They, went right. they opened him up. And Uncle Joe was doing him. great right. Right. until that air got to him but and he died. But the truth is Uncle Joe wasn't doing great or he, he wouldn't have been mm-hmm. in the but surgical suite if having all an we operation. Have. Right. Now, see, if we're looking at just, okay, well, he seemed fine before. Right. But he went in for a reason. And so that's the part that we can't discount that right. if he went in for a reason there was something going on that he wasn't talking about initially anyway and then the discovery may have come about right. and that's a really key thing to distinguish one stat yeah. and I remember this vividly because he used to be on my <laughs> sure, lesson sorry. 1981 the wow. American Cancer Society did a study and it asked what percentage of blacks believe this it was like 54% of blacks mm-hmm. believe oh, that the air, air mm-hmm. causes cancer to spread sure. Sure. and it was only 8% of whites who said they even heard such a crazy thing wow well, that's well, cultural. It's definitely, there's some cultural things that I think we're going to talk about as well as our geological Can influences. I just bring up yes, something? It, there's a good reasons why there is a lot of mistrust in our health care system, why people did not go to the doctor mm-hmm. in the past. Okay. You know, we have... What's an example? What is what is one of the reasons? Oh, my goodness. Well, let's let's just start with... Henrietta Lacks. <laughs> well, you can we can start with Henrietta Lacks or we can... Can just start with what's what's called sure. the Mississippi appendectomy. Come on, okay. uh, we have what's Fanny, Lu, well, Fanny Lou Hamer, and we know who she was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Grew 
grew up in Mississippi, you know, went to the doctor, had a little abdominal pain, came out, had a hysterectomy, mm-hmm. didn't know that she had had a hysterectomy. But she worked for the sister. The doctor and the surgeon who did the hysterectomy told the sister, oh, I removed your your servant's uterus so she can't have any kids. So you don't have to worry, worry about, about that. Them. And that is how she found out what mm-hmm. she had done. Mm-hmm. Because, and those kinds of things did occur. And it's so. called a Mississippi appendectomy, mm-hmm. meaning they would tell people, oh, we just took out your appendix. Mm. But at the same time, they removed, you know, they removed your uterus yeah. and, and you're infertile. Sure. And so the thought was, we don't need all of these kids. We want her working, and we don't want her to have kids. And so that's what you talk about, mistrust of the healthcare community. Not, you know, I was going to say Tuskegee, but that's always talked about. I want to say there are a lot of other things that happen. Which is why that distrust is so widespread. Which is why it's widespread Mm -hmm. and why we're doing this show to say, you know, Times have changed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, well, you, yeah. You, you, and we didn't have y'all in these no, places. No, we didn't have us in these places. So I mean, that helps uh, tremendous. So things have changed. You know, my yeah. my sister in law um, was born at Jewish. Um, she's my age, and because she couldn't be born on the upper floors at Barnes, but Isn't by that? the time my wife, who's a couple years younger. Was born. She was born at Barnes, mm-hmm. right. not in the basement. She was in the basement. Yeah, and people talk basement. about that yeah, all yeah, the time. Yeah. Oh no, wow. we were only in the basement. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so That's it huge. changed. Um, it you know, fifty years ago was was when it changed. Absolutely. Um, but you think about residents. The first African American who finished in surgery at Barnes is in my era. Yeah. I mean, yeah. think about it's that. It's a long time that, you know, People yeah. don't believe it to be right. the case, but That's think right. about That's that. That's right. And, it's, and, and the realization is that it's not that long ago. That we long think ago. it's so many generations removed, and it really isn't. It's, it's within this lifetime. But, but, but also, not only are we there, we're there with the presence. We're supported by the director of Siteman, and Dr. Abelon is the chief of surgery at WashU. He mm-hmm. affords a lot of the things that we're able to do through Siteman. Yeah. Right. And so we're not just there as... Figureheads. I mean, we're actively involved in research nowadays. There's so many levels of assurance, right? To, a protection yeah. for all participants that we really encourage people because we can't tell you for sure how this drug will work on an African American mm-hmm. unless an African American is part of the trials sure, to see how right. it works. We've got clinical trials on our list of right. episodes to go into major depth. <laughs> By the time we're done with this series, we want our listeners to be like many experts on this disease. We want folks to be in conversation and whatever they don't understand or don't remember, they can recall it easily by pulling up any one of these episodes that we do and prepare for them. Here's a preview of our conversation about risk factors, the stats and the facts. Dr. Hall, Dr. Bullock, a little bit about background. We need to talk about risk factors. Right. Let's start with risk factors. So we usually divide risk factors into modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors and non-modifiable risk factors are those types of factors you can't do anything about. For example, your family is your family. You, you can't get rid of your family. So they that's get to pick them. That you don't get to pick them. So that's <laughs> non-modifiable. So okay. your family history matters. And we know that if you have a first degree relative, so that's a, a father or a brother or your son, those are all first degree. If one of them has a diagnosis of prostate cancer, then you are at risk two to three times greater to develop prostate cancer. So that's a non-modifiable risk factor. And if you have two first degree relatives, so let's say you have two brothers or my dad has prostate cancer or my older brother has prostate cancer, then you have a five times greater risk of developing prostate cancer. Because of them? No. <laughs> because, of, because of your family. And you can't, yeah. Age. Mm-hmm. Prostate cancer mm-hmm. is not diagnosed commonly in very young people. It is the median age of diagnosis is around 67 years of age. So this is a disease of older men. Mm -hmm. So age uh, increases your risk. That's non-modifiable because you can't all of a sudden stop aging. I am trying. (laughs) Trying, but you can't do it. I don't know. You too. Seem to defy it. I got you. And then the last um, non-modifiable 
modifiable risk factor is your ethnicity and race. Mm. You know, whether you're Latino, so that's ethnicity, or whether you're white or African American, you cannot change that. Right. So that's another non-modifiable risk factor, and we know that African American men have an incidence of 70% higher, and then we said the mortality is 2.4 times greater than white men, and 5 times greater than Asian men. So these are the non modifiable Viable risk factors of prostate cancer. Let's talk about these myths that are, as we're seeing them as truths, that are myths. Now, address this putting my finger in my butt thing, being help the brothers, whomever struggling with that, get over it. Well, you once know, it's, for all. It, it's certainly more prevalent, or the presumption is more prevalent, the resistance by African American and Hispanics, mm-hmm. right? The people at the greatest risk of having this cancer. Right. Uh, How always, horrible is it, Doc? No, it, oh, it, it's, it, oh, come it, on. It's, <laughs> it's less than five seconds. This is what I always say. One, one thousand, two, one thousand. If, if, if you're, if, if, no, 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 no. One, two, three, four, five. It's and it's done. over. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> if, if, I always say this, Doc. I, mean, I want to be empathetic. <laughs> your doctor, your finger's so big. Look, if your average bowel movement is smaller than my finger, you need a colonoscopy sooner than later. Because something is wrong. Yeah. Look, if, if you're worried that my finger exam is so bad that it's going to change your nature, you were already <laughs> about to fall off the fence your, anyway. Your, your nature was yeah, to fall off the fence. <laughs> yeah, you were already on. You are in big jeopardy anyway. Uh-huh. Look, uh-huh. So. And essentially, that's the thing. It, a normal bowel movement yeah. would take longer and be much <laughs> m- larger than what this would entail. I, I and this str- is for I your benefit. Sh- I str- struggle with this. You struggle because, with your bowel movement? No, because it's five joking. seconds. Okay. Okay. It's five seconds. We're talking about, you know, understanding your risk and your health and it's five seconds. We can endure many, many things for five uh, but, Flames, yeah. underwater, yeah. But this, lack of oxygen, yeah. all of those <laughs> things for, for but, five seconds. But the get over it is it's not that long. It's right. not that bad and there could right. be worse. But, but in but, the end... But, but it's, it's got more life. impact than that. You know, the the point is, sir, you, it's a matter of building comfort and rapport between doctor and patient. That's comfort, and, all right. And, and, and if I can say, <laughs> sir, look, this is a f- finger exam. Would I take care of your high-end car if you wouldn't let me check your car and do an evaluation of your car so that you don't end up on the road and mm-hmm. be stuck? And you say, who's your mechanic? Sure. I'm not going to have people be in my patient and say that my doctor is Dr. Bullock. And lo and behold, someone else finds that they got a bladder cancer. Someone right. else finds that they have a prostate uh, cancer. Yeah. Why yeah. did Dr. Bullock There's find a lot that? More. So, and that goes back to being informed and, and being proactive, and, too. And if I can get to the point of saying, sir, you know, I'm trying to be a good doctor. And, you know, I say this all the time. Look, there's no cameras. And trust me, I'm not going to put you on the Internet telling how I did your rectal exam. <laughs> right. You know, nobody's that interested. I do exams all day long. Why is being black a risk factor, Doc? Well, you know, there's a lot of controversy as to what's behind it. Um, we have they have identified breast cancer genes. Um, and so there is probably a genetic basis uh, behind um, higher incidence and higher mortality rates of prostate cancer in blacks versus whites. We're um, more prone to it. Is that what they're saying? So, you know, it, it certainly runs in the family. Mm-hmm. And that's a g- genetic basis. And genetic basis, race also is related to g- genes. Yeah. Um, but there may be modifiable factors involved also with being African-American. You know, we blacks haven't been successful enough for enough generations to rule out our habits. So, like myself, I'm proud to be a second-generation college graduate. My parents graduated from college. They were school teachers, but my grandparents weren't. So, my parents, during my upbringing, ate similar to their people before them. You know, um, they they hadn't acquired enough wealth where, mm-hmm. you know, we didn't eat scrabble. I mean, we ate scrabble. We ate. We had our can of Crisco with bacon grease on the stove, and you know, uh, everything was fried. Um, and so, so we. I don't know if we have enough population of people to say that our diet could be excluded as a factor because it's African Americans consume more of 
fatty products or a higher percentage of our diet is fat and processed foods and processed foods than most any other population mm-hmm. in the world mm-hmm. are we more inclined to that because of heritage or is that another no, some genetic of it's thing a, and it's economic Absolutely. i mean okay. you know so mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. know that when we have more options and food choices sure. and more knowledgeable about what is uh, better for our bodies and able to act on it we do Don't miss part two of this conversation as we go into depth about the facts and the statistics. Risk factors on the next episode of Our Healthy Men, your prostate cancer question and answer radio show. Our Healthy Men, the prostate cancer question and answer radio show. The Prostate Cancer Coalition emphasizes the significant advancements in the detection and staging of prostate cancer and that PSA is just one of many options available to help you make an educated decision. The Our Healthy Men radio show is made possible by Siteman Cancer Center and the Barnes Jewish Foundation with your hosts, Dr. Lannis Hall, radiation oncologist with Siteman Cancer Center and Dr. Arnold Bullock, urologic surgeon with Washington University. I'm producer Jade Harrell. To listen to the full episodes, for resources, to find a doctor or to learn about events and free screenings in the St. Louis region, visit prostatecancercoalitionstl.org. And of course, we want to hear from you. Send us your questions, your comments, and especially your personal story, knowing that yours can be a help to others. Our Healthy Men is another positive production of Rare Gem Productions. Thanks for listening.